doing tonight? Welcome, welcome. Well, I'm glad to be here at worship night. This is actually my first time that I'll be here tonight for worship night. I haven't had the privilege of doing that yet. Um, Y'all can just stand with me as we get ready to sing. And before we sing, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. And dear God, thank you for tonight. Uh, thank you for a good day. And thank you for everything that you do, Lord. Just help us to have a good time worshiping you, Lord. And just take every distraction out of this room, Lord. Take, you know, everything that everybody's going through out of this room, Lord, and just keep our eyes on you tonight, Lord. And just help us to lift your name, God, and to enjoy being here tonight among fellow believers, Lord. And we thank you for everything you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
overcomes He has done great things He has done great things O oh, hero of heaven You conquered the grave You free every captive You break every chain Oh God You have done great
search for the light of day in the dead of night We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight We've all run to things we know just ain't right There's a better life There's a better life If you got pain He's a pain taker if you feel lost, well, he's a way maker. If you need freedom and saving, he's a prison shaking savior. You got chains, well, he's a chain breaker.
to take some time to pray here for a moment about things in our church, people we know about that need prayer. And thank all you guys for coming here tonight. Don't you appreciate our worship team? Appreciate them being here tonight, taking this evening also to lead us in praise and worship and just uh, blessing God, just glorifying the Lord and knowing that God inhabits the praise of his people. Well, Father, we give you praise and thanks, O oh God, this evening because you are drawing people, God, by your spirit uh, to yourself. Father, we thank you for all the people who now know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, who did not, oh God, even a week ago. We give you praise and thanks for the goodness you display, God, to families, individuals, to orphans and widows. We praise you, God, for the gospel being preached around the world. Father, we ask you, Lord, to keep on sending workers and laborers, O oh God, to the harvest field of the unreached, O oh God, and those that are in times, the Lord, of despair from starvation, from sickness, from this virus, from earthquakes, from hurricanes, from natural disasters, O oh God, from governments and oppression. We praise you, God, that you are the deliverer. And Father, we praise you that you reach right down to the, to the babies, the children, O oh God, the elderly, all over this world, this planet. And bring forth, God, people. Bring forth salvation. Bring forth healing. Bring forth provision, O oh God, and show your people what to pray about in specific. Concerning, God, the needs of the earth, the needs of our city, the needs of our nation, and Father God, the needs of people in our congregation as well. We're believing you, Lord God, for your peace to be upon the Wasson family and the loss of uh, Michael's mother. We just praise you, God, you can rejoice now in heaven, the glorified body, with a new life, O oh God, a new name. And Father, we praise you, God, your presence and peace goes before the Wassons. That in their time, O oh God, of, of mourning or grief, they, O oh Lord, would also have your grace be upon them. So, oh God, remember all the good things this woman has done, all the good times they've had together, the many good memories, oh God, of the past as well. We ask you, Lord, to touch those who've gone through surgeries, God, recently here. Linda Bertram, Father, Linda Moon, uh, others, oh God, that are going through times in the near future for surgeries. We ask you to touch them, God. Be with Allison Gonzalez, oh God, a touch her, Father, where she's at. And cause, oh God, all the symptoms that are negative, the medication she takes, oh God, to diminish and bring forth to her healing. Uh, around that porch and bring forth to her God um, wisdom to all the surgeons and all the specialists that work in her behalf and work with her as well. We praise you, God. You're lifting up and, and bringing forth strength to Ruth Moon, to Michael Moon, to Charlie DeLuna, Father God, all these with long-standing illnesses. We praise you, God. You intervene and that you are the God of breakthroughs, the Lord God who brings forth healing and miracles by your power, by your grace, even this hour, this day. Praise you and thank you, Lord, tonight that you're ordering our government by your spirit, helping your people, God, to not panic, not be fearful of anything the future has for us on the earth, because this world belongs to you, O oh God, and you, Father God, are going to be the Alpha, but also the Omega of this world and its history. We give praise and thanks to God this night for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you folks that are here. I'm taking Greg's place for one, just one uh, <coughs> week here, one month, because um. He still has a little bit of weakness, of course, in his body. The uh, family, the Barnes family are all COVID-free. They're all contagion-free, symptom-free, and so forth. But there's still a little bit of some lingering weakness sometimes it happens with those people. But I believe that Greg's uh, back here again, and we really ap appreciate all of our worship leaders and worship people that have helped st uh, come to the plate here and take the place when Greg's not been here. Um, they're actually, I think, growing themselves in many good ways also. It's been good for them, good for us. And we are so blessed to have this worship team working with us on an ongoing basis. Amen. We appreciate, again, our youth pastors, our children's ministers, our ushers, greeters, all the volunteers that are here, because you guys have kept right on going in unusual times. And um, we know that some folks out there are still going through pressure and stress because of all the societal things going on with this virus and the election and other things beyond that as well about the future. But realize again that if we take every day, wake up every day, and, and just declare God's lordship over our lives, over this planet, and over our, our, our nation, our city, uh, God will show us, can give us reasons to rejoice. The Bible talks about having reason to rejoice. God gives us that. So I'm going to speak here briefly, and I mean uh, uh, briefly for me, uh, and please excuse us. Now, when I get done talking here, um, we'll, we'll slip out here. Sean, I will. We have a, a flight to catch in the morning. Got to be up at 4.30 in the morning to head for Ohio. And it's going to be three uh, intensive days of praise, worship, spiritual warfare, intercessory prayer, prophetic ministry going on as well. And so uh, we'll slip out here and try to get to bed as early as we can and uh, get up in the morning there and hit this place. So be praying for us as well and the whole, that whole event because it's got potential, I really believe, 
to bring forth an ordering of God's spirit and desires in many good ways for our nation. So I want to talk here briefly about reviving my worship. And uh, my father, when Jesus Christ is alive inside of us, there's always motion around Jesus. You know, you don't, you don't ever see in the Bible any days that Jesus Christ would just take and not know what to do. He always would take and spend the first part of his day in prayer. And I believe he also spent time, even himself, in just giving thanks to God in worship to God, even though he's part of the Godhead himself. And I really believe that Jesus was being ministered to by angels, by God's Spirit. God would strengthen him, and God would reveal things to him in those intimate times in the mornings. And so I really look forward myself to my time in the morning with God. I hope you do as well. We need those because the Bible says in the book of Daniel, in the last days, those who know their God in intimacy, they will be strong and do exploits. Not cower in fear at the Antichrist, cower in fear at all the viruses and earthquakes and hurricanes on the earth. It says they will be strong and actually do exploits right until the very end. So part of Jesus Christ's motion, I think, in us actually includes praise and worship. And the one thing we actually can give back to God, I want to say it again tonight, is our praise and worship to Him. That's why when we come together here on Sunday mornings for our services, uh, times like this, we are actually giving to God. And sometimes folks don't feel like praising God. It's called a sacrifice of praise for them. But that's where I, I learned a long time back in my CF&I, Christ Nation's days, you press on in and you praise God regardless of your feelings and your emotions, what you're going through. And you'll find that God will give you what's called that garment of praise for any spirit of heaviness you ever face in your life. God can do that. Amen. Um, look at some of the, the mainline denominations over time. They, unfortunately, some of these guys have taken as time is going by and made worship and praise into a time of religion and a time of roach and a time of just kind of going through the motions. And so I want to encourage all you that are here, you're not doing this yet, but never do this. And that's become familiar with praise and worship and worship teams and songs and music because there really is a dynamic presence of God, moving of God, and even breaking things down of the enemy unraveling works of darkness, and actually establishing things of God's kingdom in us. Because these folks up here are singing songs. They're actually prophesying words out. Because the Bible says, every um, stroke I lay upon the enemy will be done to the noise of, of, tab of tambourines and pipes and drums and so forth and stringed instruments and the voices of my people. And so we're actually laying strokes on the powers of darkness to avenge uh, the devil of what he's done to the earth and what he's taken from the, from the earth as well and giving it back to God once again. Amen. So I want you to take and be engaged, people, in praise and worship time, and know what you're doing here in praise. I mentioned also, I think, about a week or two back that uh, I talked about God's presence. And uh, two other times, I didn't have time to talk about this on Sunday, that I really encountered God's presence in a very, very strong, tangible way. There's been more times than this, but I, I think of two major ways as far as praise and worship goes. Was um, one time, my first trip to China, I was in a place called Xi'an, which is actually a walled city with a 1,000-year-old wall around that. There has been no Christian witness, no praise and worship, no evangelism in that place as ever as far as they know. And so one of our guys in our team of 30 people, we, had, we had groups of about uh, eight or nine of us branch out, handing out tracts and doing prayer walks and so forth. We went into a mall in Xi'an, and he turned his boom box on in the middle of a store that looks kind of like Macy's, and he began to sing the old Hosanna song. This was the 1990s. It says, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna to God in the highest. And began just praising and worshiping God in that cassette tape, filling that whole place up. And you just, there's a tangible presence of God that has came down because worship and praise had not been voiced in that area for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, if ever. And it's like all of a sudden you could sense God's tangible presence kind of coming here and just kind of break open the, the whole atmosphere. And we found ourselves surrounded by several hundred Chinese people in a matter of less than five minutes. They had never heard anything like this. You could tell by their faces something supernatural is happening here. They were just dumbstruck. Their eyes were uh, just wide open here. They could not believe what they were hearing. And uh, they were just very, very just uh, enamored, I think, by it, as they sensed themselves, I believe, God's presence the first time in their lives. Second time I think about also is in the Ukraine They'd gone through revival where the, where the uh, iron curtain was broke down. Uh, preachers came in, evangelists came in, folks getting saved by the millions across Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, so forth. And um, 
I went to this uh, Frontline Shepherd Leadership Conference. There was about, about 800 people there, I think, at that conference. And the Ukrainian Christian spirit-filled believers were praising and worshiping God in a way that, again, it just made the hair sit up on the back of my head as I just had that purity of praise and purity of worship. These guys are singing from their heart. They were skilled instruments. They, they, they're very, very skilled on their instruments and their song and so forth. Uh, very artistic people. Yet at the same time, it wasn't all about talent or about how good they were. They really were pressing into the heart of God. And you could actually experience that in a way that just totally blew me away. Now, I've had good praise and worship here, other churches, South Africa, so forth. But I understand there's been unique times where I know what God can do during praise and worship times when we let God be God among us. Amen. So I'm going to give us a little, brief little teaching here from Hezekiah, 2 Chronicles chapter 28. I'm going to read from this as well about Hezekiah's response to God because he was a godly king that God used him in a story about praise and worship here that I think is dramatic as well. And it says in 2 Chronicles 28, 22 through um, 25, he gives a background about the king before Hezekiah named Ahaz. He was an evil king. And it shows the kind of a background that Hezekiah was coming out of, what Israel was coming out of. And it says, now in this time of, of his distress, in the time of his distress, King Ahaz became increasingly unfaithful to the Lord. You might, you might sometimes think that distress in a nation will cause people to always go to God, but many people actually become more unfaithful to God in times of distress because their emotions get high, anger comes up, uh, anxiety takes place, fear has torment, and torment will always bring in the powers of darkness, not the, the works of God. Amen. And so this took place for this King Ahaz. He became unfaithful to God in a time of distress. This is that Ahaz, for he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus, which had defeated him. And he said, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, I'm going to sacrifice to them that they may help me also. But they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. So Ahaz gathered the articles of the house of God, um, cut it in pieces, the articles of the house of God, cut them all in pieces, shut up the doors of the house of the Lord, made for himself altars in every corner of Jerusalem, and in every single city of Judah he made high places to, to burn incense to other gods and provoke to anger the Lord God of his father. So this is where Israel has sunk down to idols on every corner, people involved in demonic practice, but King Hezekiah was placed there by God for such a time as this. Second Chronicles chapter 29 goes on, and um, it says here in verse 1 through 5, Hezekiah became the king when he was 25 years old. He reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the sight of God, according to all his father David had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened up, notice this, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them first. Then he brought in the priests and the Levites, and he gathered them in the east square and said to them, Hear me, Levites, now sanctify yourselves, sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers, and carry out the rubbish from the holy place. So I see a pattern there in the Old Testament in this story about reopening the gates. What's the Bible say about praise and worship? I will enter into his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. And our songs of praise, that the word appraisal comes from praise. And appraisal is actually appraising the worth of something. And so I was, we was taught years back by the guy you heard prophesy here on Sunday morning. If you heard that prophecy by Kim Clement. He did a lot of teaching on praise and worship himself. He had a lot of revelation on that himself as a major worshiper, I believe, of God and a writer of songs and so forth. And he said that praise songs are songs that talk about the hand of God about what God does for us. God heals us. God's our deliverer. God's our strong and mighty tower. God is the one who's our salvation. And God does things by his hand. We enter into the gates of God with thanksgiving, being thankful for all the mighty things he's done for us. Then it goes on and says beyond that, and we enter into his courts, inner courts, holy of holies, with praise. And praise talks about uh, actually an intimacy with God himself and songs of worthship are the songs that get us into God's holy place. And so Kim was talking about in his, in his seminars, his teachings and so forth, he said, when you find songs with the word you in it, those are songs directed to God's face. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds. Nothing I desire compares with you. We're getting fewer and fewer songs with the word you in it. 
in, unfortunately, in our worship times and in our Christian songs on radio and so forth, those songs will start coming back, I believe, in due time. Nothing wrong with songs about God's hand. God wants us to rejoice and give thanks for all the good things he does for us. But God's also the God of the face. And the God of the face says, I want to seek your face. I just want to worship you, God. I don't care if you give me nothing in return. It's all about you, Lord Jesus. And we have a song that even says something like that. It's all about you, Lord Jesus. And those are great songs of worship as well. Uh, 2 Chronicles 29, verse 25 goes on and says, Hezekiah stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, stringed instruments, with harps, according to the commandment of David, of God the king seer, and of Nathan the prophet. For thus was the commandments of the Lord by the prophets. And so the prophets of God would hear God's voice, and God would give them specific instructions on how he wanted worship carried out there. He was trying to mirror what took place in heaven upon the earth. All of the tabernacle of Moses and so forth are all types and symbols of what takes place in heaven itself. And God was trying to bring heaven down to earth. Now, the Bible also speaks about a thing called the tabernacle of David. You heard about that in Acts, I think, chapter 2 or so. And in the tabernacle of David was all about a time of 40 solid years where David only had the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. That's all he had. There was no golden laver. There was no outer court. There was no separation there. There was only the Holy of Holies with the Ark of the Covenant and God's presence. And it said there's 24-7 worship taking place for 40 solid years during the tabernacle of David. And the good news is the Bible prophesies, I believe it's in Joel and also in Acts 2, it says David's fallen tent will be revived in the last days, and I'm going to restore the tabernacle of David once again back to the body of Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news? For all we have is us and no veil and no religion, just us and God worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. Now, many people that are actually Bible theologians, they believe also um, that David wrote most of the Psalms during the 40 years of where you could actually could hear the songs coming out of the tabernacle of David for those 40 years, because he could hear those songs from where he lived at. He was pretty close to that uh, tent himself, okay? So, Verse 25, uh, 26 to 28 goes on and says, The Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah commanded them to offer the burnt offering on the altar. When the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord also began with the trumpets, with the instruments of David, king of Israel. So all the assembly worshipped, the singers sang, the trumpeters sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. So worshiping God in spirit and truth actually means we supersede it with um, realizing burnt offerings must take place first of all. So God wants a shift from primarily being a deliverer and remover of all the things that's bad in us to one that actually loves him for who he actually is. Praise and worship will take and burn up the things of dross and chaff out of our lives and get us focused not upon God being our deliverer only, but God also being the one who loves us, the God of intimacy, the God of relationship, and he'll draw people unto himself. I believe God wants to take and do healings during praise, during worship. I believe God wants to take and bring deliverance and make, and he's like Saul, the evil king, cause demons to manifest and be driven out from praise and worship times. And so I believe God's anointing musicians and singers to understand and realize when we play, when we sing, we are prophesying to God and to the enemies around us as well, that they may flee, but God may come, and God may bring forth what God wants to bring forth by His grace and by His Spirit. Amen? So I'm going to wrap it up here in a moment here. Psalms 141, verse 2, the NIV version says this, May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. In a classroom, we will lift our hands up to get the teacher's attention. And I just believe that one part of our lifting our hands to God and praising God with our hands in the air is us just taking and saying, God, here I am. I sacrifice myself. I'm a living sacrifice unto you. I surrender all to you, O God. And I just give you my body, my, my being, my very soul cries out to you, O God. I just want to lift up my hands and praise and worship Almighty God. Our praise and worship helps create an atmosphere for God's presence and also gives it an ease of God's workings among us upon the earth. That's why I believe, again, in the Old Testament, Judah would go first in battle. 
because Judah would take and clear the airwaves uh, out before the enemies of Israel. And many times when Judah began to praise God, God would get so zealous for Israel, he actually would start fighting for them. In the Bible, sometimes he would send down hailstones. Sometimes he would send down wind. He would, he would do fire sometimes. He would actually would fight sometimes for Israel himself, or else he'd make them so strong, somebody themselves, their enemies would flee before them and be defeated. And so the praisers always go out first as well. So I want to encourage our worship team here. You're, you're doing a, a great ministry unto God. And be very aware that the enemy does not want you on the front lines to uh, enter in here on Sunday mornings with a good attitude or a good heart. He wants to make you have a fight with your spouse. He wants your, your dog to do something wrong on the carpet. He wants your car to be broke down or a bill not to be paid. He wants you to think about negative things that took place that week. And I'm saying focus yourself on the Lord before you come in a place like this. Put that burnt offering on the altar. Let God burn that junk up that stinks around you, amen, in life. And come in this place as best you can. Just prepare to lead us and lead, be led in the presence of God during praise and during worship as God wants us to. In 2 Chronicles chapter 29, 25, it says, Hezekiah stationed leaders. The Levites took their positions, and the priests took their positions. And all these guys were priests and musicians and singers and leaders, and they all had their positions. And I believe the main thing you're talking about here in the spiritual realm is let us position our hearts to be leaning towards glorifying God and not ourselves. You know, we have never, as far as I know, had a problem in our uh, 17 years pastoring here with people having performance issues on our platform. We've been blessed to have that because that's very rare. But uh, we, I've never seen folks have performance issues that I know about in our worship team, those that are on the platform and so forth. They all are people with pure hearts, good hearts, good spirits, and uh, God is really ministering through them in purity, and it actually is making a difference in people's lives that come in this place. Amen. So we're always edified by that as well. I'm going to close now with 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 and Psalm 22, 3. Then I'm going to turn it back to the worship team here. And 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But you are a chosen generation, royal priesthood, holy nation, his own special people, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God says we have the privilege to worship and praise, because God knows you cannot outgive Him. If you give God your praise and worship in spirit and truth, He will always pour back into your life more than you give Him. Psalm 22, 3, but you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. May God be enthroned in the praises of our people here. May God be glorified in us and through us. You guys be blessed here again. We're going to we're going to be going now, letting Jack and Hilby get closing the service down at the right time, but you guys can Worship God as long as you want. And we just want to maybe people again that keep on moving forward in our hearts, being purified, being right, and worshiping God in spirit and truth is what God's after. Amen. God bless you. That helps you out somewhat. And we'll see you folks back here. A lot of you folks bring some friends on your Sunday morning. All right. Have a good night.